Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Indy Star in the 2023 uh, Democratic candidate, mayoral Democratic candidate town hall. I am Bro Crift. I'm the executive editor of Indy Star, and I'm super glad that we have so many people here in person and live online. And I want to thank the candidates uh, to be here tonight and to share their experiences and their thoughts about how they're going to lead the city in the future um, and, and in the voting in November. Uh, I got a couple ground rules that I want to go over uh, for you, um, not for the candidates, for the crowd. <laughs> One, cell phones, let's check them, silence them. Two, voices, silence them. Let's give respect to the candidates here. They're sharing their time and their thoughts, and we want to hear from them most importantly. Now I have the pleasure to introduce Oshia Boyd, our public engagement editor. She will be hosting uh, the town hall tonight. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Good evening. As bro said, I'm public engagement editor, Oshia Boyd, and I'm glad you could join us in person and virtually. If you live in Indianapolis, I think it's safe to say you want this city to be the best it can be. The question is, how do we get there? There are obstacles and challenges ahead for sure, but our city is capable of greatness, and each of these candidates believes he or she is the right person to lead us there, at least for the next four years. Tonight, you'll have a chance to hear from four of the five candidates, Democratic mayoral candidates, on why he or she could, should get your vote. All candidates were invited to participate. The candidates may, may, may be at the front of the room, but this town hall is all about you, the voters of Indianapolis. We want to ask the questions that are most pressing to you. Many of you submitted questions via email or note cards. Your questions were vetted for appropriateness and redundancy and will be interspersed with the questions we've prepared. So here's how it's going to go. Each candidate will give a two minute opening statement and will rotate between one question for all candidates with two minutes to answer and one question for individual candidates to answer with one minute each for those. We will rotate the answering order so the same candidate doesn't always go first. To help keep track of time, we have a timekeeper in the back who will let us know when time is winding down. I want to make it clear, this is not a debate. There won't be any back and forth between candidates. Also, I ask the, the audience to be respectful and courteous to each other and the candidates. So here we are with our candidates. Let me introduce them. Incumbent Mayor Joe Hogsett, Representative Robin Shackleford, Community Activist Clifford Marsiglio, and Business Owner Larry Vaughn. Welcome. So let's get started with our opening statement. Mr. Vaughn, we'll start with you. Yes, I am Larry Vaughn. I'm here tonight uh, mostly as a realtor to bring information to the table that I felt have not gotten out in the last mayoral race and have up to this point not been on the table and have been discussed. Just walking through the downtown uh, this evening when I parked over on Washington Street, uh, the whole block is full of entertainment. I mean, a city's good to have entertainment and so forth, but that gets old when you have a booze joint on every corner and people setting up in these booze joints every evening, that's danger. And the other danger is that it is being subsidized by the city of Indianapolis and have been subsidized over the years. So I just, I'm just here tonight as a realtor to bring information to put on the table. I'm not trying to attack anybody or anybody's plan, but uh, uh, I'm just looking forward to answering questions. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, sponsoring the uh, platform, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Marsiglio. Good evening. Thank you for joining with me tonight, and I apologize I'm going to be looking at this because I'm not really that much of a public speaker. I'm more of a public doer. My name is Cliff Marsiglio. I'm here to ask for your vote. I am an unashamed progressive with high hopes for the future of Indianapolis. I believe in our city. I believe in its tight-knit communities. I'm committed to work with, work with you to strengthen the bonds. 
By day, I'm an educator. At night, I'm an activist. I train to be a mental health clinician. In all aspects of my life, I fight for what I believe in, and I'm not afraid to stand up for the people that need it the most. My priorities here in town are mental health, re-envisioning public safety, and ending home, the homelessness epidemic here in our city. As the saying goes, a rising tide lifts all. However, we can't lift that without lifting the most vulnerable first. I'm a boots on the ground leader who believes in being in the trenches. I'm in, the, I'm in on the streets where I'm told it's too dangerous to go. I work directly with the people, putting in the hard work in neighborhoods our, neighbor, our leaders will never see. I work with people suffering from addiction, and I work with those who have overdosed. I've lost friends and family members to substance abuse, and I never want to see another family member or friend go through the heartbreaking trauma that I have. As mayor, I want to continue to be an activist. I want to be the type of mayor you want to see in your city, and not just during election years. With your support, we can build a better future, so please join with me in this fight to make Indi Indianapolis a better place where everyone can be where everyone can thrive and be proud to call Indianapolis your home. Thank you, Ms. Shackelford. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to stand before you as our city's mayoral candidate. For those who may not know, I was born and raised in this great city. I have leadership experience in the private, nonprofit, and government sectors, and have had the privilege to represent the residents of Indianapolis in House District 98 for more than 10 years. Over the years, Indianapolis have borne witness to some devastating times, which is why I'm running for mayor. I truly believe we can do better. We have gone numb to the constant murders, even when it is our babies being killed. In the past seven years, the city has suffered with over 1,400 violent killings, over 200 last year, and this year, we are over 50 and counting, marking the deadliest start to any year in the city's history. Our infrastructure is crumbling before our eyes, from potholes to the lack of sidewalks and fatal crashes. Our neighborhoods have been disconnected from the well-developed downtown, and many are living in a desert, food, pharmacy, and economic development desert. When I'm mayor, public safety will be my top priority. My plan released Wednesday included 30 effective solutions to make our city safer. My goal is to focus on root causes of crime, rebuild IMPD, and right-size our force to our needs, restore trust and accountability between the community and law enforcement, and secure our families against gun violence. In the coming weeks, you will see me unfold my additional community-led plans to elevate our city. These plans will dismantle barriers with urgency, tackle progress collectively, and build in transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hogsett. Well, good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, conversation about our community and about its future. Uh, I'm uh, very, very excited uh, about the conversation that we're about to have, the town hall that will take place. I would be remiss if I didn't begin by thanking Oshia and uh, the Indianapolis Star for your uh, leadership in putting this forum together. Uh, I want to thank uh, my opponents uh, for being here tonight to participate in this conversation. Uh, it has been the honor of my life for the last seven and a half years to serve as the mayor of the city of Indianapolis. And uh, I look forward to uh, being given the opportunity and I'm asking for the opportunity to serve a third and final term. That's important to my wife. Um, but it has been an honor to represent Indianapolis and to lead this city. Um, I would be uh, less than honest if I didn't say the last three years have been quite difficult. Perhaps three of the most difficult years in our city's history. Uh, but we've made it through. We're almost to the other side, if not to the other side. And I can't wait. I'm excited for the next four or five years for our city. I think we've got a lot to look forward to. Thank you for having me. 
and let's get on with the conversation. Thank you. So this first question will go to everyone and you will get two minutes to respond. Indianapolis is a city that was founded and built on taking big risks. Building a city on a non-navigable waterway, investing to be the amateur sports capital in the world, and building a football stadium without an NFL team. What big risk idea would you seek to tackle as mayor? And we will start with you, Mr. Marsiglio. The problem I see with Indianapolis is we've forgotten what it, what it takes to take big risks. We have not taken big risks in years. I want to see a re-envisionment of public safety, and that's the big risk I'm looking at. I'm proposing that we, we divert 200 officers to be unarmed civilian respondents. Currently, IMPD is down about 12, two, 200, 250 officers right now. I'd love to see officers be able to show up without people worrying about, are they gonna be shot? Are they gonna be put in jail? For things that have, that should be social issues, that they should be able to get mental help for, substance abuse help for. The homeless should not have to worry about being policed. I wanna see, I want to see a big, I want, I want to see big risks taken. I want to see us go back to taking these risks. I'm not seeing it anymore. Let's do it. Thank you. Ms. Shackelford. Thank you. I think when you talk about big risks, we are talking about what does the community want? What would the community want to see? When I talk about big risks, I am thinking about downtown Indianapolis becoming an entertainment mecca, becoming a place where our families and kids can come down and enjoy themselves, reimagining Circle Center Mall, turning it into a space that everyone can come down and enjoy themselves. When I was in South Africa in Johannesburg, I went to this hotel and it was almost like a Las Vegas hotel, but within it, it was so big. It had a theater, a movie theater, a casino, high-end restaurants, bowling alley. Everything was under one roof. It was easy to get to. Transportation was easy to get to. I think that's what we're missing in our city. A lot of people now are in their homes because of COVID. They're happy working in their homes. But what I hear from people is there is no place for us to come out and play. There is no place for us to come out and interact, especially when it comes to downtown. So my envision for Circle Center Mall in those areas is connect this to Mass Ave, make sure the trails are connected, make sure the hotels are connected, make sure there's some easy ride shares down there, biking, um, everything, so everyone can come together. The last thing I just wanna say also is when we look at the stadiums that we're gonna put in, especially IUPUI is looking at trying to put in a new stadium so their teams will have some place to stay. Just making sure the community is involved, that the community is invested. And what will that look like that our neighborhood kids can come down and play in these new stadiums and not have to feel alienated because they're in surrounding areas. So when you're talking about taking risks, that's something that I believe in. Thank you. Mr. Hawksett. Well, I'm proud of the big risk that we've already taken. Uh, certainly the building of a community justice campus that was long overdue and desperately needed uh, was a, an enormous undertaking. When I became mayor back in 2016, one of the first things I did was impanel a criminal justice reform task force. As a result of their findings, we now have a state-of-the-art community justice campus we have as its gemstone the Assessment and Intervention Center, which is sole purpose is to divert people who are low-level offenders, keep them out of jail, and get them the treatment that they so desperately need. That is an important step forward in criminal justice reform. As the result of the, the Criminal Justice Reform Task Force, we also now have MCAT teams mobile crisis assistance teams, which are dispatched to respond to 
possible criminal activity, but there's reason to believe that it may be caused by one's substance use, addiction, or some kind of diagnosed or undiagnosed mental illness. That's been a big step forward. Not incarcerating people who need treatment. By the way, that's also known as the revolving door of justice, and we have diminished it considerably. And coming very, very soon will be the beginning of a clinician-led response team who will be dispatched in real time to help those who are in trouble and who we know may be struggling with, suffering from a diagnosed uh, or undiagnosed mental illness. No police involvement, but clinician-led involvement. Those are big ideas and big steps. Thank you. Mr. Vaughn. We have took big risk in this city over the years. I've been here for 67 years, right? I remember when Ohio Street was a bunch of uh, open pits, Washington Street, where the new Claypool is, open pits. Why did that happen? It happens because we're repeating history right now by financing businesses, mostly restaurants, uh, transitory tramp corporations that come into our city, they pay no taxes. In fact, they get incentive packages to move into our city. Name one, name uh, work, uh, Salesforce. Salesforce moved in here to the tune of over $150 million out of, our, out of our budget, that came out of our budget. They've paid nothing back, they've paid nothing for uh, taxes or anything. In fact, they have abandoned the Chase Building. Now you say, what does that mean? That means that over 60% of the property here in Indianapolis is abandoned. It's not on the tax rolls, yet we continue to say that we're collecting a TIF district off of this property when not one dime is being paid. How are you gonna make Chase Manhattan pay taxes on the Chase Tower? They'll leave it standing there. They don't care what you do to it, but the Circle Center Mall, same principle, a TIF district. It's paying nothing into the tax rolls right now. In fact, it's costing us money. It's costing us $250,000 a month to keep the Conrad's doors open in this city. So we need to stop giving uh, private businesses money. That's the risk that we've taken now. And the consequences of those risks is a receivership for the city of Indianapolis when we uh, actually do run out of money and can't pay the dividends on all these municipal bonds. Thank you. This second question will go to all the candidates as well. Historically, when we discuss redevelopment, we're talking about downtown. We put money into trails, but what about sidewalks? What are you going to do for neighborhoods to not just make them safe, but walkable versus focusing so many efforts on downtown? And we will start with you, Ms. Shackelford. Thank you. So I'm glad you mentioned the trails because I am a walker. I'm a former half marathoner. So I walk almost on a daily basis around a lot of our trails. So I'm usually walking about four to five miles a day. Love the exercise. But at the same time, I've been able to see where those needs are. When we're talking about economic development, I just wanted to give you one stat. The truth is that our per capita income is only about 31,000 a year, and that is only 1,000 a year above the poverty line for a family of four. We have to start developing the surrounding neighborhoods. One of my ideas is to use that downtown TIF money and be able to develop those surrounding neighborhoods. As long as it uh, benefits downtown, that money can be utilized. What does that look like? Affordable housing, investing in affordable housing in these neighborhoods, like over by Martin Luther King Jr., by um, Martindale Brightwood. Also, creating enterprise impact districts in distressed areas. We used to have enterprise zones, and it kind of ran through the center of town. But within those zones, you have incentives to bring in businesses, to give them tax incentives, you give them money to train employees who are hired within that area. You also have facade grants to help out some of those small businesses. 
but we have to be able to develop outside Indianapolis, outside of the downtown, and be able to develop those neighborhoods. People need jobs, they need living wages, and so my plan is to make sure that economic development is in those surrounding neighborhoods and not just downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hawksett. Well, I think economic development has been a critical uh, part of this administration's economic development in our neighborhoods, uh, has been a critical part of this administration's prioritization. Um, I suppose the most recent and perhaps one of the most uh, best examples of economic development deep inside a neighborhood that so desperately needs it is the investment that uh, Cook Medical uh, made uh, with uh, the um, neighborhood on East 38th Street uh, where a 100-person uh, factory uh, now sits uh, as well as investment in uh, a, 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 supermarket, or a food store uh, nearby. Eskenazi is building uh, out in that neighborhood. Uh, and it's with that kind of leadership uh, that the city of Indianapolis has taken development directly into neighborhoods that, frankly, had not only been overlooked, but felt ignored. Now, there's a sense of purpose and there's a sense of commitment, certainly on East 38th Street, but what East 38th Street and the investment there has done is rekindled the, the hope that other neighborhoods have. And the other thing that makes me so proud of that development on East 38th Street is the entire construction of the Goodwill Cook Medical Facility at that location. 100% of it was done by XBEs. Not a sub, not even a prime. They all were XBEs. What has been accomplished out there is something most said was impossible and it's been done. Thank you. Mr. Vaughn. You know, you can't give a person a place to stay, a roof over his head. You have to get that for yourself. You have to support yourself. When you give money, I've been in so many Metropolitan Divorce meetings where they have given millions of dollars to these tramp corporations to open businesses and so forth. They, they're only worried about the time and material for building these monstrosities that they're building right now. They're going to not pay you a dime back, and all they're doing now with these uh, new apartment complexes is allowing people to come in on the uh, breath of uh, COVID money and giving them 12 months rent. That's enslavement. I mean, anytime you do that, you're depriving that person of the ability to learn the ability of how to make it on his own. They're destroying lives. Anyway, uh, about the streets and so forth, it's the same problem. Every major city has a commissioner in place over their public works so that when they get money appropriated from the city council, the, the commissioner takes charge of it and it does not go into the general fund. And you know the chief executive can use the general fund for any purpose that he's wanted to. And we've established that many times in public safety meetings and uh, DPW meetings. So when you actually have a commissioner, same thing with IMPD. The commissioner gets the money, he takes the money, and he uses it for the purpose that it was uh, appropriated for. But everybody talking about the murder rates and so forth, the mayor should have nothing to do with that. He should only have uh, permission to do in emergencies. And uh, the commissioner and the FOP should be able to run their department as they see fit. Uh, determined by the money that they actually have in their coffers for that purpose. Thank you. Mr. Marsiglio. As we talk about infrastructure and the crumbling infrastructure, we talk about one-off projects that happen in places where I've seen community activists work on these projects for years and years without the city's involvement, only to have the city claim involvement at the last minute. I live on the east side. I bike around through the east side. I go to the areas that nobody wants to go. I bike, like, like Representative Shackelford. I'm on the trails. 
I biked here today. I, I, it was kind of a little stunt that I did. I was like, I'm just going to bike to see what it's like on the way here. It was a beautiful day. You know what? Downtown's perfect. We, most people don't live downtown. They're living on the east side. They're living on the far west side. They're living where the cultural trail isn't at. We see bike trails that have potholes in them. People have to depend on public transportation. People, not everybody has cars. You can see where the people who the administration favors, you can see streets from all the way up in Nora, all the way down to the city council. You see streets are perfect. You get over to my area, streets are back to being bad. We need sidewalks, we need roads, we need, a, we need an administration that goes into the city. We need people to see the problems and not just show up during election season. Thank you. So this, these questions will be given to individuals. We'll start with you, Mr. Hogstep. Gun violence and the number of homicides has broadly risen since you took office in 2016. Why should voters trust that your administration will be able to tackle this problem? Well, sadly, the truth is gun violence has been on the rise in the city of Indianapolis for 20 years or more. Um, it was certainly made manifest uh, to a greater degree by the ravages of the pandemic. But that's why uh, three years ago, uh, or excuse me, earlier last year, uh, over a three-year period of time, uh, we implemented a $150 million commitment uh, to uh, uh, gun violence uh, and gun prevention. And uh, I will tell you in short order that the investments we, may, uh, we are making uh, are starting to have positive effects. The, the $45 million that we're giving to neighborhood and uh, community-based organizations, it's making a difference. Last year alone, 2022, we saw the largest single decline in murders in the history of IMPD. Not declaring victory, but the progress is being made. Thank you. Mr. Vaughn. I could care less you've, about gun I, have, I haven't read the question yet, sorry. You've said a lot of controversial comments in the past. How do you plan to move past that? I don't because I meant everything I said. And you know why? Because uh, people are not being realistic when they go out and try to say, I'm going to help this person whether he wants it or not. The reason why they're doing it is, just like you heard a lot of people talking tonight about how the, the uh, mental illness we have, most of the times that's to sell dope. Even our pastors have stooped so low as to turn their churches into uh, dope houses. So I'm just sick and tired of people. Everybody wants to help. The mitigation, the laws have to be changed. I mean, you can stand on a corner and mitigate, we're gonna do this for this homeless shelter or do this for that homeless shelter when there's an answer is in our Constitution, Article 9, the third section of Article 9. It says any city that has a person in need of the benevolence of this city can go to an asylum, which this Marion County, any county can establish without help from the legislature. So that's, that's the problem. Thank you. Mr. Marsiglio, unlike some of your opponents, you don't have experience serving in elected office. Why should voters trust that you have the experience needed to serve them as mayor? You know what? Seeing everybody's elected, elected duties, I feel like, yes, I'm an unpolished politician. I'm here trying to fix the things that I've seen other politicians not even want to attempt. I'm here with new ideas. I don't want to do things the way everybody's always done them. I come from a background of academia. I come from a background of mental health. We don't see this in politics. We see lawyers. We see other folks that naturally filter into the law. I want to see somebody who's focused on the community. Thank you. Ms. Shackelford, speaking to voters who are unconvinced that Mayor Hawks said shouldn't get a third term, 
Can you explain to them why you think Indianapolis needs a change in leadership? Well, I would say one of the things is the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability. I'm hearing from the public that we don't know how much federal funding we got. We don't know where it went to, what projects was done, until we actually see a press conference and the money is already gone. There is no progress report for all the promises that was stated. Did you complete these promises? What didn't you complete? In my administration, I will have a progress report quarterly letting the community know my progress on my commitments. And then also, I will hold regular community meetings to get input from the community and be out in the community. So there will be meeting with the mayors that the public can come to and share their ideas. What I'm hearing from people is just our mayor is absent from the community from critical conversations. He's there for events to stop in and out, but when it comes to actually sitting down and working on some of these community problems, that's why we need a new mayor. Thank you. This question will be to everyone. Explain one specific policy proposal you have that the city is not currently doing to address public safety concerns, crime rates, and homicides. And I believe we're starting with you, Mr. Vaughn. Like I said before, now listen real good. Every large city has a commissioner. Chicago has one, LA has one, all the large East Coast cities have a commissioner for their police department. That way, when you get money appropriated, like it's more than half our budget, $700,000, $700 million. But what happens is, is when the council appropriates that money, it goes into the general fund. And I will mention this, that I've actually seen it happen. When we had the Super Bowl under Mayor Ballard, $143 million was taken out of the public safety budget to sponsor the Super Bowl. And you should see the tax breaks they got to bring it here. No taxes were charged on their income. They got uh, no taxes charged on the hotel. So what we're doing is, is we're being a patsy. I did see a, uh, some information, a brochure I got on uh, tourism. Indianapolis was not mentioned in that brochure, and they included Midwest cities and other places where you could uh, go and have a good time for your convention. So I think that the thing of it is, we just need to get a commissioner for our police so that they can be happy, so that they can make projects and actually fund them without coming back to the pot and, and $100 million is gone. So that's what's been happening now. And he, he, Mayor Hawks said tonight, uh, just uh, guilty of this. Every mayor have been guilty of it. And we need to straighten that out if we, if we want to grow our city and the murders and so forth. If somebody's going to murder, they're going to do it. I don't think that should even be something that the mayor is actually concerned about. Thank you. Mr. Marsiglio. Public safety is something that we've been absent on here in Indianapolis for the last seven and a half years. The first thing that this administration did was to get rid of the role of the director of public safety. When I think about public safety, it isn't just police. However, for murders, we need to talk about that. We need to focus on prevention first and foremost. However, we also have to focus on what we have right now. When I talk with officers on the street, they say they don't feel that the administration has their back. They feel like they can't do their job. When I talk with the chief, he gives noncommittal answers about things that other chiefs in the past would have given absolutely overwhelming positive regard for our public officials. When I've talked with the head of the ATF in Columbus, I worked with them for several weeks to try to find out what we could do about things such as project safe neighborhoods, bringing that into the bringing that into our cities to make sure that people who are trafficking guns, people who are committing violence are putting put away for a long time. I don't want people put away just because they have a gun. I want people put away because 
they're hurting other people with weapons. We need to reinvision. We need to reinvision what we believe in as public safety, and it's again, it's not just the police. We need to be we need to be proactive, not reactive. However, with with what we've put up with over the last seven and a half years, we may have to be reactive until we can go back to being proactive. Thank you, Ms. Shackelford. Thank you. So I sent out my legislative survey and I simply asked the question, do you feel safe in your neighborhood? 60% of the respondents said no. One thing I want to do uh, that is currently not being done on that law enforcement side is definitely re-bring back the public safety director. We need someone at the administrative level that can handle the police and actually deal with law enforcement deal with those issues within law enforcement. When you're mayor, and we, this is a large city, we have seen the time commitment is not there to be over public safety and also be able to run the city. The second thing I wanna do is when it comes to accountability and transparency, any uh, shooting involving law enforcement, any aggressive excess force, get that body camera footage within 48 hours. That should be released to the public. There is no reason that we are sitting on this footage while we're trying to decide what happened. We can already see what happened, and the public is usually protesting that they want to see it. When it comes to prevention, I want to make sure that we are investing in our youth. Our youth want more safe places. So I want to partner with schools, with faith-based organizations, also with community-based organizations to make sure that our youth do not pick up a gun, giving them training in alternative dispute resolutions, and then making sure we're partnering with them organizations for intervention programs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hawkset. Yeah, in terms of uh, crime generally, uh, my uh, commitment to this audience and to the community would be um, stay the course what we are doing is making a difference. This is an issue that did not occur overnight. It's an issue that far predates seven and a half years ago. When I was the United States Attorney, the city of Indianapolis saw a 15% and a 30% increase in the number of homicides. So it is a uh, well-known challenge that not just Indianapolis, but many urban areas. So when I say stay the course, $150 million has now been invested. $9 million for greater police and more modern uh, technology. $45 million for uh, local neighborhood-based community organizations, who, by the way, no one knows their neighborhoods better than the neighbors themselves. That's why we're empowering them to help us collectively prevent uh, crime. Uh, it, it will allow us to hire 100 additional police officers and put them on the street. Uh, it will allow us to continue the effort uh, to reduce the number of uh, homicides and non-fatal shootings as we have done over the course of the last year. I think that the progress that we have seen uh, in 2022 and uh, the beginning of 2023 gives me hope that while it's not going to be done overnight, the numbers are moving in the right direction and the investments that we are making are making a difference for a safer Indianapolis. Thank you. <laughs> this question is for everyone as well. We had a lot of questions about this. How do we get our, our city roads fixed for a long-term sustainability, fixed for long-term sustainability? With all the taxes we add to registering vehicles to include tire taxes of all things, what does that money go toward? Every year we have craters appear after winter season and every year we patch the patches. So I believe we are starting with you, Mr. Marsiglio. One of the things we, we need to do with our city roads is make sure that the Donut Counties are paying their fair share. 
one of the problems we have with this is we have the wrong messaging when we say that. And anybody listening out in the audience from those Zona counties, yeah, I want you to pay. And we should be a little bit nicer about how we say it. Um, with center road mileage, it, it really penalizes cities with four lanes. Whereas growing up in the rural Indiana, a dirt road gets the same amount of tax dollars per mile as Meridian does around 38th Street. One of the things that I've heard people talking about is we could, we could open up our alleyways and say, these are roads. This would actually double our center mile, our allocated center, ah, this would double the roads that we have in Indianapolis per, per the allocation and it would double the tax money that we're getting right now. Will, will the state allow us to do this? We don't know, but we have that in our ability at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Shackelford. Thank you. I think everyone is tired of riding over potholes. I think we see now that we are in a crisis. Our roads have went from being half pleasant to now within every half a mile, you're either gonna damage your car, your axle, and most likely not be reimbursed for it. When it comes to the funding for our roads at the state level, I will be relentless using my 10 years of experience with the legislature and using my relationships to sit down with those leaders and figure out how are we gonna fund Marion County roads? What is that formula gonna look like? I am not gonna stop until we get this done. I'm hearing from people that they are willing to pay a little bit more. I don't know what that little bit more looks like, but that may be an option. And I'm gonna say all options are on the table because we have gotten to the point where it's so bad because we have not sat down and taken risks and sat down and collaborated and got solutions that now we're in crisis mode. And so we're gonna have to sit down with the legislature and get this funding figured out. That is the main thing. DPW, I have heard from many constituents, many people saying that they see DPW out filling the potholes, not cleaning them out before they fill them, just dumping in the hot mix and then coming out and refilling the same pothole within a week because they filled it in the rain, they filled it in the snow, and just didn't do an effective job. Matter of fact, just did a poor job. When I'm mayor, DPW will work in a more efficient way. We will have incentives for actually filling potholes once and getting it complete the first time instead of keep having to go out. So those are just some of the things. And then for the pothole reporting, I wanna implement a Louisville style reporting system where people can upload that information on Twitter. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Hogsett. Well, there is one option off my table, and that's asking any Marion County taxpayer to pay more in taxes than they already are. Because we are a donor county. We pay into state government much more than Marion County receives. And I'm not gonna ask Marion County taxpayers to foot any of the road bill. That is why I'm pleased that the City County Council authorized a $1.1 billion infrastructure investment over the next couple of years for our city. And those monies are gonna be used to upgrade and update the infrastructure throughout our community. It's been mentioned, and I think it bears emphasizing, that what is at stake here is nothing short of the most archaic, out of date, inequitable road funding formula that Marion County receives from our state government. Our state government, and Cliff was right in this regard, we receive as a community for Keystone Avenue the same amount of money that a rural county receives for one lane mile. 
my hometown, born and raised in Rushville, Indiana, they get the same amount of money for their one lane mile road that we get in Indianapolis for Keystone Avenue. And I don't need to tell anybody in this audience that in many places, Keystone Avenue is six lanes wide. That has to stop. And by the way, Cliff, I will take issue. The, the inequity is not directed at the contiguous counties. The inequity is, is borne by the rural counties. That's where it needs to change. Thank you. Mr. Vaughn. I will say one thing that uh, we all remember major moves, right? Now, when major moves, they uh, reduce the requirements for the material that is used in our infrastructure under Mitch Daniels. He's in a nursing home now. But in any case, but it, where he deserves to be. Now, in any case, he don't know who he is. But in any case, the same thing I talked about. This would not be an issue for the mayor, right? if we had a commissioner so that if he said, here's a billion dollars, the commissioner could receive it and actually spend a billion dollars on our roads. Our roads are in shambles. <laughs> I mean, you could, don't take too long when you ride around, right? But uh, the other thing is too, all this traffic that's going around from the construction that's going on, all these heavy trucks and so forth, I doubt whether it's going to get any better as long as that keeps ha happening. And the congested traffic, that's part of the thing. So, Joe, you're not all to blame. I'll let Mitch get some, <laughs> I'll let Mitch get some of it, but we still need somebody to commit to having a commissioner appointed for our public safety and for our actual uh, DPW. So, just like in the big cities, when they receive that money, they say, hey, Boys, we got a billion dollars, let's make our plans. They don't have to worry about another Super Bowl or another so-called bubble. We spent $50 million on that. So uh, we need to get those separated. And then mayor won't have to, the, ten, to, the temptation. Thank you. Whoever it is, probably be Joe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this, can't, this, this question will go to individuals. So we'll start with you, Ms. Shackelford. You've been in elected office at the Indiana General Assembly for more than a decade. What have you accomplished or legislation you're most proud of in that time that should give voters confidence you can serve them well as the next mayor? Thank you for the question. Being in the legislature, since I've been there over 10 years, I have been in a super minority. But being in the super minority, I have been able to accomplish a great deal to help our community. Now, I'm not saying it's all in all enough. I will continue to push. When I first got in, I actually was able to pass the first pilot program for telemedicine. Without that pilot, we would not have telemedicine legislation, and we would not have been so prepared for COVID when it came, because then we had those in place. A couple of years ago, I was instrumental in passing House Bill 1006. That was our law enforcement bill. That was the year that we had protesters, that we had COVID. So now law enforcement are penalized if they turn off their body camera, the record follows them no matter where they go. We were able to redefine chokeholds as a deadly force and many other things. There has been constant food desert legislation that I will continue to push. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hogsett, this one is for you. Voters and your opponents have said that things need to change. Why shouldn't Indianapolis change and why should voters continue to support you as mayor after you've had more than seven years in office? Well, the truth is that the last three years have been three of the most difficult years uh, in our city's history and we had created in the first term a great deal of momentum that was carrying us into the second term. What I didn't know on election night in uh, 2019 was that three months later uh, a global pandemic uh, would uh, strike uh, our city uh, and has not denied but has delayed a lot of the progress that we made early on. 
uh, I would hope that voters would give me the opportunity to finish the job that I started in 2015, that we were well on our way to building momentum throughout the city in so many different ways. That momentum was uh, sub subsided by the three-year global pandemic. But I believe that the next four to five years in the city of Indianapolis, and we can talk about this in a later question, will be the most exciting four to five uh, years we've had in recent history. Thank you. Mr. Marsiglio. I'm sorry, I should go to Mr. Vaughn. What do you see as the biggest problem facing the city of Indianapolis, Mr. Vaughn, and what is your solution to address it? The biggest problem I see is everybody going around now trying to sell uh, dope out of their trunk. Everywhere I turn in this city, somebody is talking about Oh, he needs mental health. He needs this. He needs that. That's a waste of human resources. Once you get stigmatized with a, with a diagnosis of a mental illness, you cannot go on a construction site. You cannot go in many places where you might be in danger, a warehouse. They don't want you around. And uh, we're doing more and more to get our people uh, hooked on dope, and, and everybody's going along with it. I don't know whether it's the pharmaceutical companies or anything that's sponsoring it, but we need to stop that, and I would stop it. I would stop the actual mitigation. We have all these 501c3s. They're going around, getting people's ID and so forth, and they're milking them dry and throwing them back out in the street. They're poverty pimps. We need to stop the mitigation and get the laws changed. Thank you. Now, Mr. Marsiglio. What specific actions that are in your power as mayor do you plan to take that will effectively reduce violent crime in Indianapolis? One thing that I've thought of quite a bit, and Larry's probably going to disagree with me on this, we need to stop worrying about things such as simple possession. I realize our prosecutor has focused on this. I go out in the streets. I carry Narcan everywhere I go. I carry fentanyl strips. I want people to stop getting on harder drugs. When we talk about violence within the city, most of that comes from drug trafficking. When you're dealing with drug trafficking, it is a high price game. And when people are dealing with narcotics such as heroin and fentanyl and otherwise, they're going to shoot each other. Let's focus on things such as, you know what, if somebody wants to smoke a little bit of weed, fine. I don't do it, I don't like it, but there are ways that we can get people to stop doing the hard stuff. Thank you. So this is another question that will be given to individuals, so everyone will have their own question. I will start with you, Mr. Hogsett. Okay, I have to read this one. I saw today there are, I don't know what that says, in wages, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> For every dollar of shoplifting, I think this is five. Um, I'm sorry. Indy passed a wage theft ordinance. So let me start there. Indy passed a wage theft ordinance in 2016 from the mayor. And how is that going? for all of uh, what you would like to do in office for workers. So we'll just stick with the wage theft <laughs> ordinance. So how is that going? Well, let me just say that uh, wages uh, have been adjusted upward by the city in uh, several different ways and over the course of time. Most recently, we had a comprehensive compensation study uh, which suggested that and I'm talking about uh, positions that are not represented by bargaining units. A lot of our employees are, are unionized, and therefore their wages are determined by a collective bargaining process. This compensation study uh, helped those whose wages had been stagnated uh, significantly. Uh, and this summer alone, a uh, shameless plug for summer employment for our young people, we're paying our parks wor uh, workers $15 an hour. And if you sign up before May the 5th, I believe you get a $500 signing bonus. 
So $15 an hour is well above minimum wage. Uh, it is right at a living wage, and I encourage everyone to take advantage of it. Thank you. Mr. Vaughn. Dan Parker in Indianapolis, the Board of Public Works, passed a policy this year allowing contractors on multi-year projects to put a change of order request or request to change the bid price in case of significant cost increases. Who then becomes responsible for the cost increases? I don't know who comes uh, 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 responsible for them, but the way I look at it, and when I was bidding jobs and stuff, that's considered in the contract, and if it's a contract, then they have to uh, perform according to the contract. But if you have somebody that's going out and bidding jobs, and they don't know how to bid a job, and they uh, underbid or do something like that, that's, that's their responsibility. And if it's a job that there's a bond on, well, they lose their bond to make up differences. But I think when you go out, here's the uh, thing I'm concerned about. When you go out and say we need so many minorities this, and so many minorities that, and these minority businesses are not capable of doing any of that work, yet you give them the contracts, in some case the contract is given, and then it's bought back at 2%, that goes on too. But the thing about it is, if you have somebody that you're trying to help in construction business, you can't help nobody in business. There's no favors in business, not one. Thank you. Mr. Marsiglio. What are you specifically going to do to increase transparency in all aspects, all aspects of accountability as it pertains to our elected officials within the city of Indianapolis? So one of my jobs with Indiana University is, is as a data analyst. I focus on transparency, focus on metrics, focus on the ability to make metrics that we can see and act on. When we talk about things such as, I wanna increase diversity, how, what does that actually mean? How are, you, how are you measuring this? And oftentimes when we're talking about what we wanna measure, we are not measuring correctly because it's an abstract thought. I wanna focus on getting actual hard data. And I want these to be in dashboards that everybody can see. And I want them in dashboards that we can prove that we are following through with the promises we made to the city. Thank you. Ms. Shackelford, do you think it's important to deter police from using excessive force in their interactions with the public? If so, how do you plan to accomplish this? Thank you for the question. I definitely think it's important uh, to deter excessive force when it comes to law enforcement. We have seen a lot of our community members, whether if they're out protesting, whether if they get pulled over, that that excessive force is used. One of the things that I mentioned earlier is making sure that that body cam and dash cam footage is released to the public within 48 hours, making sure that we give a fine if they turn off their body camera. Right now, they can get a misdemeanor according to the House Bill 1006 that I mentioned earlier. But if they turn off that body camera trying to conceal any kind of crime, then I would like to implement a fine along with the um, misdemeanor that they can possibly use. Thank you. Thank you. So this will be to all the candidates the same question. And I believe we are starting with Mr. Vaughn, right? My son was shot and killed by law enforcement responding to a 911 suicide crisis call. We all saw what happened to Herman Whitfield. As mayor, how would you improve 988 response? What are your specific plans to address crisis response? Like I said, I'm not dealing with that because the commissioner and the FOP deals with that. The mayor deals with the business functions of the city. He represents the city. He is not bogged down because somebody well, I'm not gonna get personal, but he's not bogged down with stuff like that, and I would not be considering that because that would be delegated to law enforcement. They get uh, the lion's share of our budget, they get the lion's share of our budget here in this city, and they should be able to move autonomously and take care of the problems of crime prevention on their own without any oversight from a person that has no training, 
that has not uh, been in any type of law enforcement to come and tell them what to do with their appropriations. So the commissioner, then uh, the mayor's off the hook for that. He should be off the hook. Thank you. Mr. Marsiglio. When we talk about public safety and people having to be afraid of the police, especially when we talk about mental health crises and t dialing 988, we know that here in Indianapolis, all officers are supposed to have CIT training. However, we find out it's only the new officers who are getting it. Even with that, this crisis intervention training is only 40 hours. As a trained therapist, 40 hours isn't even enough work to be an associate level clinician. It is not enough to de-escalate. We need to keep police out of issues like this. We need unarmed civilian respondents because nobody responds well to a mental health crisis with having two officers with guns pointing at them. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Shackelford. Thank you. Um, I think the MCAT program is a great program. Um, it needs long-term funding because that is a program that we need to expand. When we're talking about who's going to be on the scene first and it is a mental health issue, we definitely do not want a law enforcement officer that has not been trained properly and don't know how to handle the situation. The Herman Whitfield III case was a horrible case and that is something that we do not want repeated. In House Bill 1006, one of the things that was in there was de-escalation training throughout the career of the officer. So not just when they came in, but throughout the career. We need to make sure that the city is abiding by this new law and making sure those officers are getting trained, everyone on de-escalation. We definitely do not want to have this happen anymore but we have to look at the training and look at the funding. And I would also say we need to look at the funding just for mental health crisis in general, making sure that we have more providers, making sure that we have a pipeline of kids who are going through the system who want to be a mental health specialist. We have to make sure that that funding is there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hawkshead. Well, in fact, uh, that is in no small measure why we added $30 million of our $150 million um, crime prevention uh, efforts to uh, mental health. And uh, I think that's an important, a very, very important commitment that we've made. I mentioned uh, earlier in our conversation tonight some of the steps that we have already taken to address the issues contained within uh, your question. And that is the deployment of mobile crisis assistance teams throughout the, the community uh, when we know that there may be a um, substance use or a mental health uh, related challenge on, a, uh, on a, uh, a call that has come in alleging uh, some kind of wrongdoing. And uh, even before, uh, the tragedy uh, of Mr. Whitfield, we had already um, agreed in partnership with Faith in Indiana uh, to begin the progress that will culminate very uh, shortly with a signed contract on clinician-led response teams. No police officers, just professionals helping people who we have reason to believe are a danger to themselves or a danger to others. And we have reason to also believe that it is solely a mental health challenge. And that is why Faith in Indiana was a great partner in helping us, first of its kind, in the state of Indiana. They, I'm sure, would like to see it introduced in every community throughout Indiana. But Indianapolis is doing it first, and we're going to begin within a month or two. Thank you. This question will be for everyone to answer as well. And we are gonna start with you, Mr. Marsiglio. What is one specific policy proposal that you, ha that you have that is not currently been done, being done to address the affordable housing shortage and homelessness in Indianapolis? 
It's interesting. I've sat in meetings over meetings over the last seven and a half years where we've said, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do this. A check gets written. Contractors come in. Developers write checks to politicians. And then these projects go away. In my own community, we've had two projects that were supposed to be low barrier to entry homeless shelters that I championed that are now apartments for people making 150000 and above. If we followed through, we could actually do what we needed to. But when you're, when you're focused on increasing your war chest so you can get a higher office, and you're focusing on taking money from people just so they can build apartments, we're never going to have this happen. We're never going to get the housing that these people need. We need to follow through on our commitments to the people we've made promises to. Thank you. Ms. Shackelford. So thank you. Right now, I just want to give a stat uh, that nearly two out of every three renters in Indianapolis can't afford rent, and things are getting worse. We have to address the rent situation. We have to address homelessness. Some of the things I want to do uh, that are not currently being done is at the state, they have just created a statewide renters, um, a renters tenants rights coalition. I would like to see that coalition at the city level. We have to put the power with the tenants to make sure that we can stand up to these landlords, especially if a housing community is unsafe. We have to think about what can we do to control rent. We have seniors on fixed incomes. I'm listening to them. Their rents are $1,200, $1,300, and they're constantly going up every time they renew their lease. So we're going to have to give the renters some type of power when we're talking about what does that look like. Other thing is we got to make sure that we're using some of those affordable housing incentives, like I said, to start building in our surrounding neighborhoods. We are about 30,000 short of affordable housing units. So how do we take some of that money or those incentives that are actually in the downtown area and put them on the outside areas? I want to also look at all types of housing, all types of affordable housing. And that includes 3D, tiny homes, manufacture homes and container homes. We have to start thinking outside the box of what does the housing look like. And then lastly, I wanna make sure that we're investing in family and non-denominational homeless shelters. We have heard from different religious beliefs, different communities that they want a non-denominational shelter. They don't feel comfortable going into Willers because it is Christian based and I visited a family shelter, only one in Indianapolis that we definitely need more where the family unit can stay together. Thank you. Mr. Hogshead. Yeah, I would say that as it relates to affordable housing throughout the city of Indianapolis, we need to build all kinds of housing, um, frankly, and uh, whether it's workforce, uh, whether it's uh, below market rate housing, uh, we need to be building it and that's why uh, I'm pleased that the transit-oriented housing uh, that we have been uh, promoting as a city, uh, I think we've added uh, over a thousand units uh, in the last uh, year or so alone. Uh, we need to be doing more transit-oriented development for those who rely on public transportation uh, to get to and from their jobs and uh, their, their uh, their families and their grocery stores. Uh, I also think that we need to increase uh, the HUD uh, uh, supported uh, housing uh, that uh, has built uh, 3,100 units uh, over uh, since 2020. Uh, I think that has been a, an important step forward for more, to, more greater uh, affordable housing. And then to double down uh, on those two uh, aspects of greater uh, units of affordable housing. We have dedicated, uh, I believe it's $20 million in American Rescue Plan uh, monies 
to allow Indianapolis to leverage uh, even more uh, the creation and the building of even more uh, affordable housing. So I, I think that uh, we're off to uh, a good start uh, in addressing a critical need, and now we just need to keep, uh, keep our fo uh, focus on all types of housing for all types of people, because everyone deserves a warm place to call home. Thank you. Mr. Vaughn. There's no such thing as affordable housing. Uh, HUD did recognize that for a while, but Bud Myers got rid of that. So now, when they come to plead down at the Metropolitan Development Board, they don't even have to plead uh, any kind of an amount of affordable housing within these projects that we're issuing municipal bonds for. So that's off the table. What's happening is, whenever government syndicates, whenever government says we're going to pay your rent, we're going to pay a portion of your rent. We're going to uh, give you $40,000 when you uh, leave the closing table so you can go buy you a new car. That's destroying the housing market. Now, I had real estate training years ago, and you don't have the government coming in, putting their fists down, and saying that we're going to pay this person that lives next to you to move in this neighborhood, like Bart Peterson told me, to move in this neighborhood so that it can come up but he doesn't have to pay taxes for five years. So you have to pay taxes. So as long as you're doing that, it's inequitable, and it's a real blight on our city whenever you have somebody trying to arrange housing for a person in a glutted market that have been overpriced and is now being churned. So uh, all these new built buildings and, uh, that they're putting up all over town, they're in the process of being churned. I don't know whether you know that what happens to them or not. They lease them up, they sell them, and then they foreclose on the mortgage, and then they get liquidated. And so that's the receiver that comes in at that time. So uh, Mitch Daniels set all that up. But in any case, the chief executive should not be providing housing for uh, anybody. It should be an open market. And like you said, with the rental problem, nobody can uh, stop a contract. Courts enforce contracts. Thank you. So we've come to our final question, and this one will go to everyone as well. And I believe we are starting with you, Ms. Shackelford. Would you support a salary increase for the mayor and the city county council members? If so, how much of an increase? If not, why not? This is kind of a gotcha question. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's <laughs> When you ask an elected official if they would give themselves a raise, most of the time they're going to say no. And I would definitely say no. Um, if it came to just thinking about myself. Now, when it comes to when I'm out of this position and we have to recruit for a mayor, we may need to look at increasing it because we have to remain competitive. The mayor's salary has not been raised in years. Um, so as I say, if I was just thinking about me, no. I consider myself a public servant. I don't do this for the money. But there may come a time when we're looking for a mayor and we want to be at that competitive edge. For the city county council, that's on them. I will let them make that decision if they want to get a raise or not. And I think they made it clear that they do. <laughs> <laughs> so. I would just say, if you want to look at any more of my policies, make sure you go to robinforandy.com to get more information. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hogsett. Well, I have never uh, accepted any raise at any uh, uh, level of public uh, service that I've rendered. Um, and it's uh, for a very simple reason. I'm not seeking to serve the public in order to uh, make money. Uh, and Robin is correct. Uh, the mayor's salary here in the city of Indianapolis has not uh, increased uh, in some considerable uh, period of time. Um, and I certainly would not support uh, the mayor's uh, uh, salary going up as long as I'm mayor. I may have a different view of uh, if elected this November whoever might succeed me at the end of a third term. Let me tell you what I think 
my philosophy is as it relates to the public's credibility when it comes to being asked to raise political salaries. And this is why the city county council this time did as I ask. I simply said to them, if you're going to raise your own pay and you are underpaid, make sure that the pay raise is only effective after the next election so that you might benefit from it or you might not. And in the meantime, the public gets an opportunity to wade in at the election time as to whether they think you deserve a pay raise. So, in my case, I would simply say that if elected to a third term, I would certainly consider toward the end of my term because it is and would be a final term. I would consider uh, supporting for the first time a pay raise for whoever the next mayor would happen to be. It would not be me, but I bet they would benefit and enjoy having the mayor's salary raised. Thank you. Mr. Vaughn. Hey, what makes think, you think you're going to get another chance, buddy? I, but any I said <laughs> if. I hey, said listen, if. No, I will get as much money as I could, right? <laughs> because if the way things are now, if more people will come to these meetings and look in on this city from time to time, then we'd have a better city. But people just don't want to do it. And the city council did give themselves a raise, which they much deserved. And uh, they're fighting over those jobs now. So uh, if I was mayor, I'd try to get as much money as I could. I'd tell you that right now. <laughs> Bribes and everything. <laughs> Just spit it on out there. Well, but thank it. you. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Marsiglio. <laughs> you know what I think? You know what, I think I'm with Larry on this. I, this sounds great. I, if any of these other three get elected, absolutely no, they should not get a raise. However, if I'm elected, I'm with Larry on this. Um, I doubt it. However, when it, comes to, when it comes to elected politicians, what we don't talk about is, so I believe the mayor makes 90 some thousand, the mayor doesn't have to pay for t gas. The mayor doesn't have to pay for food. They doesn't have to pay a lot. They get a per diem. It's almost twice as much as their salary. They are not suffering. This is a public service. Nobody should be making over a hundred grand in public service. We don't need professional politicians running our cities. We need people who are passionate about our cities. When it comes to people like our city council, they are vastly underpaid. They're vastly underpaid. It's, we expect them to do a full-time job on part-time pay. I, I know several people who I've actually tried to get to run. I've actually tried to get people to run instead of me running for this office. And people, people often say, I don't know if I can do it. I can't do it. I want people to run for city council and they can't do it because with the little bit of pay, they're not going to be able to take their day job. They're not going to be able to have a professional life and still serve the public. And this is what we need them to do. For me, lower the, price, or lower the pay of the mayor. I don't care. Thank you. <laughs> she makes more than I do anyways. That's just more problem. <laughs> well, we have come to the end of this town hall. Thank you, Mayor Hogsett, Representative Shackelford, Mr. Marsiglio, Mr. Vaughn, <laughs> for your participation. <laughs> to the audience, thank you for your thoughtful questions. I hope what you've learned, that you've learned a lot about the candidates and what you've learned tonight will help you make an informed decision on who will get your vote for mayor of Indianapolis. Thank you and have a good night.